When the Earth first formed, it was a ball of molten rock. It had a homogeneous composition, meaning an even distribution of minerals everywhere. As the Earth cooled, different minerals began to segregate by density, with more dense material like iron and nickel sinking towards the center of the Earth, and lighter material containing silicone and aluminum rising towards the surface. Over time, distinct layers formed containing different combinations of elements. These layers vary in density, consistency, and other physical characteristics. The outer layer on which we live is a very thin, rigid coating covering the planet. It is called the crust. Its thickness varies from a few kilometers under parts of the ocean to about 30 to 35 kilometers under the continents. It is made up mostly of oxides of aluminum and silicon. Below the crust is the mantle. The entire mantle extends from the bottom of the crust to about halfway to the center of the Earth, ending about 2,800 kilometers below the surface. The transition between the crust and the mantle is characterized by an increasing amount of magnesium-containing silicate minerals. The mantle is divided into a number of sublayers based on differences in composition. The top layer of the mantle, just below the crust, is rigid like the crust. The crust and this rigid layer of the mantle are together called the lithosphere. The lithosphere ends about 100 kilometers below the surface. The next layer of the mantle is the asthenosphere, which extends down about another 100 kilometers. At this depth, the combination of temperature and pressure allows some of the mantle material to melt, giving the asthenosphere a viscous, fluid-like consistency. This fluid-like layer is what drives tectonic activity as the rigid lithosphere above is able to slide over it. Below this thin layer, the pressure increases enough so that even though it's still very hot, the mantle takes on a more solid, plastic-like consistency. To understand why the asthenosphere exists, it's helpful to think about how conditions change with depth in this region. Both temperature and pressure change across these transitions from lithosphere to asthenosphere and then into the upper mantle. Since the temperature at which a material will melt depends upon pressure, we can draw a line across this chart showing the boundary where mantle material will melt. To the left of this line, the material will be solid. To the right of it, the mantle will melt into a liquid. Comparing this to the actual temperatures in this region shows that in the lithosphere, temperatures rise as we go deeper until right at the beginning of the asthenosphere, it gets hot enough to start melting. But then further down, the pressure increases enough to move back to the left of the solid liquid boundary, allowing the material in the upper mantle to remain solid. This transition back to the left of the boundary represents the beginning of the upper mantle. The upper mantle is still somewhat ductile, but less fluid-like than the asthenosphere above it. It extends from the bottom of the asthenosphere down about another 500 kilometers. The next transition is between the upper mantle and the lower mantle. The lower mantle has the same overall composition as the upper mantle, but due to differences in pressure and temperatures at these depths, the elements present form different combinations of minerals. As with the upper mantle, the, its composition is plastic-like. That is, it is solid but ductile enough to flow slowly over geological time periods. While this layer only extends about halfway to the center of the Earth, it is the largest region of the Earth by volume. At the base of the mantle is the core mantle boundary. It is about 200 kilometers in thickness and includes a region where temperatures get hot enough to partially melt the mantle material right above the transition region between the mantle, which is dominated by silicate minerals, and the core, which is mostly iron. Below the core mantle boundary is the outer core. The outer core extends another 2,200 kilometers towards the center of the Earth. It is primarily iron. This iron is hot enough that even at the immense pressures found at these depths, it is liquid. The final layer is the inner core, which extends the final 1,200 kilometers all the way to the center of the Earth. The inner core has the same composition as the outer core, but is solid because the pressures at these depths are great enough to prevent the iron from melting. When considering these regions, it is important to recognize that there is some overlap between them. Near the surface, a distinction is made between the crust and the mantle. This distinction is based on the mineralogy of the region, with the crust having more minerals containing the elements silicon and aluminum, and the mantle having, among other things, a greater abundance of magnesium-containing minerals. Overlapping these sections are the lithosphere, asthenosphere, and upper mantle. These layers are characterized by their consistency, with the crust and topmost layer of the mantle having a solid, rigid consistency. The asthenosphere, which has the same composition as the mantle material above it, is hot enough that it can partially melt, allowing it to behave like a liquid. And finally, as we go deeper, the pressure increases to a point where less melting occurs and the mantle takes on a solid but ductile consistency. Each of the remaining boundaries represents changes in the composition of the Earth due to the original density-driven sorting that occurred during the planet's formation and the behavior of different elements and minerals 
at the immense temperatures and pressures found at these depths. If you found this video helpful, please consider sharing it and giving it a thumbs up. Feel free to comment with any questions or suggestions, and if you want to keep up with the content here at Science Primer, click the subscribe button. Thank you for watching.